Today we're going to be looking at Eden Rock. Um, it's a really interesting poem in the sense of, of the kind of messages it's putting across to us. Um, there will be quite a bit of context that we need to look at before we can really start to unpick this poem. Okay, so this is our kind of basic context, just to start us off here. So the first thing that you need to know is Charles Causley, who's the poet, um, was born in Launceston, Cornwall. Okay, so Cornwall, if you don't know it, it's, you know, it's by the coast, it's quite a scenic part of the country, um, lots of kind of nature, lots of fields, uh, lots of streams, which will become relevant later on. And he was an only child, so he had no siblings, and he was seven when his father died. And again, all, all of these bits of context will become much more clearer as we go through. So he died in 2003, so he was born in 1917, so that is during the kind of last part of World War I. Uh, that also means he would have lived through World War II. And again, we'll think about the impact of that. So the poem was published in 1988. The poet is thought to be, sorry, the poem is thought to be autobiographical. So potentially he's talking about his parents here. And the last bit of information, which I think is again, quite relevant. So Causley said that he had made up the location of Eden Rock. So as much as it sounds like it could be a very real place, it's never existed as far as he's concerned. It's, it's a dreamlike place, okay? And that brings in the idea of the idyllic life. So an idyllic life is kind of your ideal life, your perfect life. So this is an element of fantasy that we need to consider as well. So what I want you to do now is, is read the poem, okay? So I'm going to give you a little bit of time. If you just pause this video and read through that poem, um, you should have a copy of it in front of you. If you don't, please get in touch with me and, and I can get you a copy. Okay, so that should have been enough time for you. Uh, again, if you haven't, please pause the video, give it a read. And then we're going to look at these images. So we've got uh, a man in a tweed suit. We've got a woman in what we'd call a sprigged dress. We've got three lights. We've got a picnic blanket with a picnic basket. We've got three kind of tin plates. And we've got a bottle of HP sauce. Now, for those of you that don't know HP sauce, um, quite a popular sauce, probably not as popular as ketchup, but that's a, quite an old bottle of HP sauce there. So my question for you is, well, how are these images going to link to the poem? Okay, and actually, there's a, there's a repetition here. I'm wondering if you can spot it. There's a, a numerical repetition going on here. So uh, the tweed suit then. So tweed, quite a kind of, quite a nice material, uh, typically kind of associated with people that potentially might be going into the countryside that, that kind of want to dress up, but maybe haven't got the kind of money to afford a really, really expensive suit. So tweed suit, again, quite a classic suit as well. Uh, a sprig dress, same sort of thing then. It's quite a, quite an older style of dress. I don't think many people would wear this style of dress now. And it's, it's basically making it clear to us, isn't it, that it's set perhaps a little bit further back than the 1988 publication date that, that was originally indicated. Uh, we've got lights then. So we've got three lights. For those of you that do kind of religious studies, you might recognize this as a reference to the, the Holy Trinity. For those of you that don't know about that, we're going to go through that in a, in, a, in a short while, so don't worry too much. We've got a picnic blanket. So think about what that represents, that idea of picnic. You know, you'd normally do that as a child, you'd go with your family, and it would be kind of a, a nice activity for everyone to take part in. Uh, the tin plates, so these blue plates at the bottom. Now, tin, was kind of a, a cheap way of, of getting plates that you could take on a picnic. So now I imagine if you went on a picnic, you might take plastic plates or even disposable plates, but these tin plates would be kind of a, a cheap way of getting kind of light and, and easy to clean plates that, that wouldn't break in your picnic basket. Again, linking back to the idea of this poem being set much earlier, than the, the kind of publication date. So this is a poem that's that's gone back in time. And if there was any doubt there, 
we've also got the HP Source bottle and we've got that, that kind of older style branding on it. So let's move on. Let's have a look at the context. So the title of the poem is Eden Rock. OK, for those of you that don't know Eden, I'm about to read you a passage from the Bible. Um, so this is this is how it goes. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. OK, so for those of you that don't know, the man that he forms is Adam. So we've got Adam and Eve. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and from there it divided and became four rivers. So, again, I want you to have a think about how is this going to link? So we've got the idea of Eden. We've got the idea that it's it's a perfect place. It's a place where, you know, if if you don't know the story of Adam and Eve, I would definitely recommend that you, you have a look into that one. Put it simply, uh, Adam is created. Eve is then created from Adam and, and she is kind of they're, they're there to kind of keep each other company. And they're told not to kind of eat from the, the tree of knowledge. Obviously, they do. And they end up getting kicked out of this, this Garden of Eden, this perfect place. Now, the reason I want you to be really acutely aware of this is because Charles Causey, as we said, he's, he's created this idyllic place. And this, this idea of Eden flows all the way through this poem. So just before we move on, have a think about, well, what would your own idea of Eden be? What would what would your perfect place be? Because remember, your Eden, your, your own Eden would be somewhere you'd want to spend a lot of time and somewhere that you'd find perfect. In front of you, then, we've got this idea of the Holy Trinity. So this is another piece of context. Remember that all the stuff that we know about uh, Causley is really important but for this poem actually it's the religious context that is more crucial and more important and this is the kind of stuff that in the exam you would be expected to refer to probably more than the fact that Causley for example lived in Cornwall so remember with your context you've got to prioritize that context and think about well what is the most relevant to, to what I'm saying so we've got this idea of the Holy Trinity. Now, the Holy Trinity is made up of three things, as, as you would have in a trinity. So you, the way that it came about was essentially that Christians were taught to worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. So there's three things, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But they were also told that they could only worship God. You were only allowed to pray to God. So... We've got this list. We must worship only God. We must worship God the Father. We must worship God the Spirit. We must worship God the Holy Spirit. But there is only one God. Well, the way that they kind of avoided the confusion of this is to say, well, this Holy Trinity is representative of God. God is all of these things together. He is not just one specific thing. He is all around us in all of these different forms. So that's kind of how, how that idea was created. Now, the reason I'm referring to this is because the number three is considered a religious number. It's considered a relevant number. It's considered an important number. And that number is going to be referenced in Eden Rock quite a bit, actually. So I really want you to think about this idea of the Holy Trinity and why that is so important. So you'll need to bear with me a little bit. The notes for this one, um, they were made uh, before my whiteboard was fixed and they're all in red and they're all a little bit scruffy. So rather than me kind of editing them off, I thought actually they're worth leaving on and, and I can kind of talk on top of these and, and add some extra ideas in there. So this first stanza then, let's read it. They are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack still two years old and trembling at his feet. So we start with this, this vague pronoun, OK? They are waiting for me. Now, I've put this idea of it being vague and almost like a, a memory coming into focus, the idea that he's, he's thinking back to 
a memory of his childhood. You could also argue that it's the idea that that we're supposed to know who they are, that actually he's recounting it almost to himself or to somebody that knows the memory that he's recounting. So they are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. So that idea of beyond, well, to be beyond something isn't necessarily to be in that place, it's to be past that place. And there's a suggestion, isn't there, that actually, where is it they're waiting? Is it a physical place? Is it a kind of metaphorical place? Is it is it something to do with the afterlife? And, and that's what we really need to think about with this poem. This poem essentially explores a very specific memory with very specific details, you know, and, and they're shown through the language choices, but also it explores the idea of the afterlife and and kind of re reuniting with your parents in the afterlife. So uh, they are waiting for me. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed. So I've picked that out there, the genuine Irish tweed, because that that noun phrase is very specific, isn't it? OK, it's not just a tweed suit. It's not just a suit, but it's a genuine Irish tweed suit. It's the same suit. So, again, that's suggestive of the idea that he's used to seeing his father in this suit, that it's something that he always remembers his father wearing. And you might find you have the same sort of thing. If you think back to when you were younger, you might find that actually you you have specific memories of your parents wearing specific clothing okay maybe there's a specific t-shirt or a pair of shoes that you always associate with your parents again quite similar to the idea of um i've forgotten the name of it now just one second um before you were mine okay so when she talks about the heels and she talks about dancing in those heels you've got that link in terms of clothing and in terms of footwear uh, his terrier Jack, still two years old and trembling at his feet. Uh, a terrier is a, a type of dog, okay? And again, it's the idea of still. So we've got same and we've got still. And we bring in that idea of it being frozen in time. This is something that is fixed. It's something that is the same, okay? And then we've got that, that verb trembling, trembling at his feet. Well, is it trembling because it's excited? Is it trembling in fear? Is it trembling because it's young and inexperienced? Why is that dog trembling? And I suppose, again, it comes back to the idea of Causley is giving us really specific details. He's trying to make it clear to us that this is a very vivid memory. OK, so this next part then. My mother, 23, in a sprig dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. So I'll go through it line by line. Um, you know, again, we've got this memory. We've got the memory of the mother now. So we've, we've changed focus from the father to the mother. Um, the first thing he kind of draws us to is the, the age. So she's 23. Uh, his father's 25, suggesting that, that, you know, this is probably a couple that have been together since they were quite young. Obviously, they've had him probably quite young. And they're kind of a typical couple of that era because it would be quite typical for a couple to have a, a child at that age um, in a sprigged dress. So I've shown you an image of what a sprigged dress is. It's not necessarily that relevant other than to tell us the era uh, that it's been written about. But what I've picked out here, so we've got sprigged dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat. We've got a list there. We've got listing going on there. And what we've got is listing of very specific very clear details, okay? For example, remembering that his mother has a ribbon in her hat, that's quite a specific memory. And you could argue then that he's, as he revisits this memory, he's becoming overwhelmed by all of those details. The next thing that I want to pick out, and this is a key quote for me, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. So it's up to you how much you remember of that. But I would certainly make a note that that's a really key quote. There's a lot to pick out there. Uh, and we'll try and pick out as much as we can now. So if something is stiff, you know, that adjective stiff, it means that it's something that is quite formal, something that doesn't really bend or change easily, uh, something that has structures and rules to it. OK, 
the color white the color white represents purity okay especially in a religious context you know if if something is white or someone's wearing white it suggests a kind of a religious presence a kind of purity an angelic presence there's something there in that color isn't there okay now if we combine that then so the stiff white cloth this is an unusual image if you think to having a picnic uh, on the grass you would certainly not bring along a stiff white cloth you would not bring along uh, a picnic blanket that would stain as easily as a white cloth would so Causley's used that but I think that actually he's he's suggesting something else now I've talked about this before and I've talked about the idea of the funeral shroud you know the idea of if someone was to die especially in certain cultures or in the past you would cover them in a, in a funeral shroud and to give them their dignity you know just before burial so if you look at the bottom left there I've talked about this idea of it's a positive memory of his parents that's been intercepted by the later memory of his parents' death, as if the memory of seeing his parents dead is, is coming into play here. It's, it's suggestive, isn't it? That actually something, something's happened to them and, and he's thinking to that, even as he goes through this pleasant memory, he's thinking to that idea of them being dead. Not the, uh, not the, the nicest memory, but um, again, we've got the idea of it being quite a religious idea as well, you know, um, if you were to go into a church, for example, and you go to the altar, they normally have a very crisp, stiff white cloth uh, over the altar. And again, it's, it's treated almost like a religious artefact. Uh, and we could say that it's almost like a ceremony. You know, this is a representative of a religious ceremony. Uh, the last part then, her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. So it's that idea of her hair taking on light, being lit up, linking to heaven and linking to being angelic. You know, when you think of an angel, you think of their hair being golden and illuminated. So again, he's kind of presenting his parents here as religious figures, as people that are beyond this world, as people that are kind of changed by religion and changed by 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 God, in a way. This next stanza then, um, again, we've got a lot of detail in here, so I'll read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. She pours tea from a thermos, milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. So, We've got, again, listing, haven't we? We've got these very specific actions using these very specific nouns. Um, you know, a thermos is basically a way of keeping something hot. Um, so you might call it a flask now. So she pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle. So, you know, back in back in the 1920s, ignore the thing that says 1950s. Um, um, in the 1920s, people would reuse things, you know, a lot of stuff came in glass bottles, glass jars, and people would save them, they'd wash them, and they'd reuse them. And that's what we've got there, that old HP sauce bottle with a screw of paper for a cork. So while we can't really say anything about the symbolism of that, there's not really anything that kind of relevant there in terms of symbolism what we can say is that Causley is using that language he's using those specific references to represent how clear this memory is for him and then we've got the idea of slowly setting out the same three plates so when we talk about same we're saying here that maybe it's that comfort that actually there's a consistency to that that his parents always do the same thing and it relaxes him we've got the number three now, if you remember what I said about the, the Holy Trinity, um, we've got a repetition of a religious number. OK, we, we're representing the Holy Trinity there. And if you think about as well the adverb slowly, you could argue that, again, it's almost it reminds us of a religious ceremony. It reminds us of some kind of ritual that's done. Um, the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. So, again, he's got very specific memories there. 
Now, it's worth pointing out to you the structure here. Let's take a moment to talk about the structure and the kind of form that's happening. So we have got a kind of half rhyme scheme here. It's not always obvious, but we've got things like um, screw, blue. We've got, um, let's just have a little look here, dress and grass, hat and light. We've got similar sounds, but they're not quite rhyming, are they? They don't quite rhyme in the way that we'd expect them to. But actually that, that kind of gentle rhythm that we've got from that rhyme scheme is really key because it's relaxing to us. It's a pleasant sound. It's not a specific rhyme scheme. It's not even a rhyme scheme really, but we've got those similar sounds. And again, it's that similarity that provides comfort. Um, equally, if you look at the stanzas, the first four stanzas are four lines long. So they are consistent. They are kind of, again, quite calming, quite pleasing to look at. There's a nice pattern to it. And we'll talk about the last stanzas uh, when we get to them. So that's that stanza and let's move on. So these are the last three stanzas. Um, you'll have to bear with me. There's quite a lot of notes for me to go through and there's some quite key ideas to talk to you about there. So I'll take it one stanza at a time. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water leisurely and that's where we're going to end that stanza so the sky whitens we talk about this idea of you know when when sky when the sky whitens it's quite a strange experience isn't it you know typically the sky is blue or gray but it's very rare that you would ever see a white sky so we could talk about the idea that actually it's artificial that actually it wouldn't really happen and it represents that it's becoming like heaven. There's a change happening. Again, we've got the number three. And we've got the idea of the sun. Again, you know, in terms of Christianity, uh, Christians believe that God created the sun. So it's the idea of it's almost an intervention from God. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. So what's happening here is actually there's a separation starting to happen that actually the mother is struggling to see the son to see the speaker and she's she's kind of looking at him but it's over that stream now that stream is representative of lots and lots of different things so generally that stream is is separating them is separating the parents from the son okay that's that's the basic image here now, if we think about streams and water, water divides and water separates. And this could be metaphorical for the, the bridge between life and death. You know, that actually there's, and, and you'll see what I mean as we get towards the end of the poem, that there's this idea that they are separated. You know, there's, the parents are in the afterlife and the son is in, in kind of everyday life. He's, he's not passed on yet. My father spins a stone along the water. So, you know, spinning a stone, perhaps suggesting that there's a boredom there. They're kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. And the speaker's aware of that. We've then got leisurely, they beckon me. So this is kind of almost enjambement, but not quite, because we've also got punctuation at the end. So... I think that's something that's quite relevant. We've kind of got the idea of enjambment, but there's also shizura there. You know, there's also that idea that there's a, there's a pause with that punctuation. It's up to you how you talk about that. Again, you can be open and you can talk about the fact that it's not quite enjambment, that actually the line is split, but it's also punctuated. It's also kind of end stopped with a comma. And it could represent the idea of him wanting to move or, or not quite being able to move in the way. Remember, enjambment is flowing from one line onto the next or from one stanza onto the next. And here, it's not able to happen because of that. There's something stopping it. There's that comma stopping it. Um, and it says, leisurely, they beckoned to me from the other bank. 
I hear them call. See where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. So this is the end of the poem now. And I think that it's becoming really obvious that this isn't just a childhood memory, that actually there's there's current memories and, and current feelings seeping into this memory. And that's shown there when they, they beckon to him from the other banks and he hears them calling. Now, it's the idea that they want him to join them. OK, now, remember, we've talked about the idea that the stream represents the kind of the bridge between life and death and that actually they're they're waiting for him. And it might be that he's closer to the end of his life now. You know, this was written in 1988. Causley died in 2003. So perhaps he's kind of dealing with the idea of, of passing on to the afterlife. And we see that encouragement, don't we? I hear them call, see where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. So they're almost, you know, they're not as hard as you might think. It's, it's reassuring and it's encouraging to him. They're saying to him, actually, it's not as bad as you think. It's, it's easy. You know, don't be scared. And I think that's how we've got to take this, that actually it's about removing that fear of death, because there are lots of people that are scared of dying and scared of death and, and scared of their loved ones dying. And what I want you to be really conscious of is actually here, you know, th they're almost exploring that, that comfort that actually, you know, to, to cross over into death is to go and join your loved ones that have died before you. Um, crossing, again, that, that's kind of a, a euphemism for dying. You know, to cross the river is to die. We've also got, in terms of structure, we've got three lines here and then we've got a single line stanza for the last, last stanza. So... Uh, just talking about that kind of empty space between the stanzas, that could be representative of the kind of stream, that there's something dividing him from his parents and the Jack Russell, the, the Jack, the Jack Russell. Um, and again, you've got that reflected in that structure. The last line then, I had not thought that it would be like this. OK, so he's separated from them. This is him now on his own. And that idea that actually he hasn't anticipated things to be like this. Now, that's very vague. We don't know if it's good or bad. And again, we've got that, that kind of vague pronoun of this. We don't know, and he doesn't know what it's really like, but it's not like what he thought it would be. And again, the poet's purposely left that vague. He's purposely left that kind of unanswered because actually for all of us, we experience death differently and our, our views of death might be quite different. So just to finish then, this is a, a poem that explores a childhood memory, but it also mixes it with the, the speaker's current feelings. So this is from the point of view of a speaker who has potentially kind of, for want of a better word, is close to the end of their life and they're thinking back to a childhood memory, but they're also thinking about what crossing to the afterlife might be like and, and what might be waiting for him. The writer is using really specific details to, to make clear imagery to us. Um, and we've got lots of religious imagery in there as well. So this is kind of my basic talk through the poem. Obviously, you might have different interpretations and that is completely fine. You might read different interpretations online. And in fact, I encourage you to do that. But this is the interpretation that, that kind of I've got of this poem. I'd love to hear your own interpretations. So if you want to send them to me on Show My Homework or send me an email, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Because remember that in poetry, it's not just one reading and that's it. Actually, there's lots of different ways you can interpret this. Uh, just to finish then, I want you to think about, you know, this poem is all about family and it's all about loss. And, and kind of childhood. What other poems could you link this to that we've read so far? And actually, are there any other poems that that maybe have similar themes or indeed contrast in those themes?